Hello and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. Today, I would like to ask you a question. What is an existential crisis? Let me answer that question for you. An existential crisis is when someone is at the point where they're questioning whether their life has any meaning, any value, any purpose. They're to the point where they're questioning the very foundation of their existence. Now let's take this to the next level, right? Let's really think about not only the existential crisis of one individual or just somebody, but the existential crisis of everybody, of humanity, of the human species. Author Naomi Klein says in her book, This Changes Everything, that the existential crisis of humanity is climate change. And you know what? I agree with her. Now let's talk about why. Maybe you're one of those people who don't believe that human beings are causing the climate to change. Well, if you're one of those people, then I guess you also don't believe in science. Or you don't believe in evidence based off of factual information. The science is pretty clear. Even corporations that make profit from fossil fuel acknowledge that science. And they're actually making contingency plans to readjust and adapt to a world that's more warmer based off of the very gases that they're emitting. So even in the corporate world, the science is not being acknowledged. And if you are one of those people who don't believe in climate change, I would recommend you read this book because Naomi Klein did an excellent job doing the research. I mean, the work cited is over about like 60 pages or a little more. And you know, I did some fact checking. I looked a lot of the stuff up and you know, a lot of those sources that she's providing are science based. So I encourage you to do your own research. It won't take you that long. It's pretty evident now. But that's not really the primary focus of this book. There are a lot of pages dedicated to that, the science behind what, what's going on. But the primary focus of this book is that we know based off of science that the CO2 based chemicals that human beings are emitting in the atmosphere based off of transportation and other energy uses are making the world more dangerous to inhabit for us human beings and we're reaching a point where we're making the earth almost in uninhabitable for the future generations of humanity. This is what the science is telling us. Yet, we still continue to do what we do. We're not making the changes necessary to avert this danger, right? We're not following what the science is telling us to do. So why is that? Why is that? Well, Naomi Klein has an answer, and I'll quote it right now. The real reason we are failing to rise to the climate moment is because the actions required directly challenge our reigning economic paradigm deregulated capitalism combined with public austerity. The stories on which Western cultures are founded, that we stand apart from nature and can outsmart its limits, as well as many of the activities that form our identities and define our communities. Shopping, living virtually, shopping some more. They also spell extinction for the richest and the most powerful industry the world has ever known, the oil and gas industry, which cannot survive in anything like its current form if we humans are to avoid our own extinction. In short, we have not responded to this challenge because we are locked in, politically, physically, and culturally. Only when we identify these changes do we have a chance of breaking free. So what Naomi Klein is saying is that our very values, the foundation of the philosophy that we're taught that supposedly is the right philosophy, we have to go against that to make the changes necessary to avoid the dangers of climate change. And in this way, it's an existential crisis because now we have to question the very meaning of our values. The fact that what we value is what's leading us ultimately to extinction. It's a hard thing to come to terms with, but Naomi Klein is challenging us to do that. So what can we do about it? Well, Naomi Klein brings up several suggestions. We will need comprehensive policies and programs that make low carbon choices easy and convenient for everyone. Most of all, these policies need to be fair so that the people already struggling to cover the basics are not being asked to make additional sacrifice to offset the access consumption of the rich. 
That means cheap public transit and clean light rail accessible to all. Affordable energy efficient housing along those transit lines. Cities plan for high density living. Bike lanes in which riders aren't asked to risk their lives to get to work. Land management that discourages sprawl and, and encourages local low energy forms of agriculture. Urban design that clusters essential services like schools and healthcare along transit routes and in pedestrian friendly areas. Programs that require manufacturers to be responsible for the electronic waste they produce and to radically reduce built-in redundancies and obsolescences. There is no doubt that these types of policies have countless benefits besides lower emissions. They encourage civic space, physical activity, community building, as well as cleaner air and water. They also do a huge amount to reduce inequality since it is low-income people, often people of color, who benefit most from improvements in public housing and public transit. And if strong living wage and higher local provisions were included in transition plans, they could also benefit most from the jobs building and running those expanded services, while becoming less dependent on jobs and dirty industries that have been disproportionately concentrated in low-income communities of color. So what Naomi Klein is saying here is that there needs to be some sort of social movement based off of a, a shift in the mind, a paradigm shift of values that's fair you know there needs to be fairness a lot of solutions are being offered but they're not fair if fairness is front and center in solving the issues then these solutions will be easier to push it'll be easier to make these solutions happen because socially they're fair listen to this the lesson from all of this is not that people won't sacrifice in the face of the climate crisis it's that they have had it with our culture of lopsided sacrifice in which individuals are asked to pay higher prices for supposedly green choices while large corporations dodge regulations and not only refuse to change their behavior but charge ahead with ever more polluting activities. Witnessing this, it is perfectly sensible for people to shed much of the keener enthusiasm that marked the early days of the climate movement and to make it clear that no more sacrifice will be made until the policy solutions on the table are perceived as just. This does not mean the middle class is off the hook. To fund the kind of social programs that will make a just transition possible, taxes will have to rise for everyone but the poor. But if the funds raised go towards social programs and services that reduce inequality and make lives far less insecure and precarious, then public attitudes toward taxation would very likely shift as well. There is a direct relationship between breaking fossilized free market rules and making swift progress on climate change, which is why if we are to collectively meet the enormous challenges of this crisis, a robust social movement will need to demand and create political leadership that is not only committed to making polluters pay for a climate-ready public sphere, but willing to revive two lost arts long-term public planning and saying no to powerful corporations so oftentimes when we get to this point where people start talking about oh we got to raise taxes oh we're gonna have to tax corporations for the co2 emissions that they're doing things like that we get to this point where oh what are you trying to threaten free market society what are you anti-capitalist what are you socialists what's going on here are you some far left liberal out there doing this thing that you're undermining the American capitalistic system, right? And what happens is we start falling to, into this trap of, okay, political camps, what side are you on, this, that, and other thing. And, and what's interesting is that Naomi Klein is saying, look, this problem goes above all that. This type of wrong value system that our society is based off of and seeped in all the political camps, socialist camps, capitalist camps, Republican, Democrat, conservative liberal it's all over the place listen to this the truth is that while contemporary hyper globalized capitalism has exacerbated the climate crisis it did not create it we started treating the atmosphere as our waste dump when we began using coal on a commercial scale in the late 1700s and engaged in similarly reckless ecological practices well before that moreover humans have behaved in this short-sighted way not only under capitalist systems 
but under systems that called themselves socialist as well, whether they were or not remains a subject of debate. Indeed, the roots of the climate crisis date back to core civilizational myths on which post-enlightenment Western culture is founded. Myths about humanity's duty to dominate a natural world that is believed to be at once limitless and entirely controllable. This is not a problem that can be blamed on the political right or on the United States. These are all powerful cultural narratives that transcend geography and ideological divides. The philosophy that Naomi Klein is challenging is one that says, look, we can take as much resources as we want. You know, this is our world and we're, we humans are here to conquer it. And the resources are limitless. Here, Naomi Klein quotes a colleague of hers to even illustrate that point further. It is our predicament that we live in a finite world and yet we behave as if it were infinite. Steady, exponential material growth with no limits on resource consumption and population is the dominant conceptual model used by today's decision makers. This is an approximation of reality that is no longer accurate and has started to break down. And how has it broken down? Well, through climate change. Another thing Naomi Klein is proposing, and the science is, is clear, is, is pointing toward this direction, is that we need to basically abandon fossil fuel energy. And if we don't do this, we're ultimately setting ourselves up for extinction, to put it bluntly, but to put it truthfully. So these half solutions are not an option. Things like hybrid cars, for instance, or like energy efficient fuel, or like car systems that reduce the amount of miles per gallon, things like that, is not enough <laughs> because ultimately we're still emitting the chemicals in the atmosphere that are leading toward our extinction. <laughs> Listen to this. Often these compromises are rationalized according to the theory of low hanging fruit. This strategy holds in essence that it's hard and expensive to try to convince politicians to regulate and discipline the most powerful corporations in the world. So rather than pick that very tough fight, it's wiser and more effective to begin with something easier. Asking consumers to buy a more expensive, less toxic laundry detergent, for instance. Making cars more fuel efficient. Switching to supposedly cleaner f fossil fuel. Paying an indigenous tribe to stop logging a forest in Papua New Guinea to offset the emissions of a coal plant that gets to stay open in Ohio. With emissions up, up by about 57% since the UN Climate Convention was signed in 1992, the failure of this polite strategy is beyond debate. And yet still at the upper echelons of the climate movement, our soaring emissions are never blamed on anything as concrete as the fossil fuel corporations that work furiously to block all serious attempts to regulate emissions and certainly not on the economic model that demands that these companies put profit before the health of the natural systems upon which all life depends. Rather, the villains are always vague and unthreatening. A lack of political will, a deficit of ambition, while fossil fuel executives are welcome at UN climate summits as key partners in the quest for climate solutions. I mostly ride a motorcycle to commute. So for the longest time, I used to think like, cause you know, a motorcycle, I spend about fifth of the cost of gas commuting the same distance with a motorcycle than I do with a car. So off the time in my mind, I'd be thinking, wow, not only do I look cool on a motorcycle, I'm a, a greener person. Look at me, I, I'm green, I'm greener. I'm spending less amount of money on energy. Look at me, I'm so green, I'm so environmentally friendly. Look at the, how much less money I'm spending on gas. Look at me, right? <laughs> but actually, I'm no better than the dude that's driving the H2 Hummer <laughs> or whatever version that's out now. I'm still emitting chemicals in the air that are causing the climate to change to a point where it's becoming uninhabitable for human beings to live. I'm still doing that, right? <laughs> Maybe not as much, but I'm still doing it. Am I really that much better than anybody else? Hmm? We know that we are trapped within an economic system that has it backward. It behaves as if there is no end to what is actually finite. Clean water, fossil fuels, and the atmospheric space to absorb their emissions. While insisting that there are 
strict and immovable limits to what is actually quite flexible, the financial resource that human institutions manufacture, and that if imagined differently, could build the kind of caring society we need. So again, how do we do it? How do we address this problem? I still have to commute to go to my job, right? Or to do other things, right? People still need to travel. How do we do it? Well, as Naomi Klein is saying in that quote, there needs to be a huge paradigm shift. We really need to, we need to reimagine how we're living in this world. And those necessities in life that we have to do, like commuting, we have to figure out ways to do that that don't cause chemicals to be emitted in the atmosphere that negatively impact our future generations. Listen to this. A 2012 study from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives compared the public value from a $5 billion pipeline, the rough cost of Enbridge Northern Gateway, and the value that could be derived from investing the same amount in green economic alternatives. It found that if $5 billion is spent on a pipeline, it produces mostly short-term construction jobs, big private sector profits, and heavy public costs for future environmental damage. But if $5 billion is spent on public transit, building retrofits and renewable energy, economies can gain at the very least three times as many jobs in the short term while simultaneously helping to reduce the chances of catastrophic warming in the long term. In fact, the number of jobs could be many times more than that according to the in Institute's modeling. As the highest end, green investment could create 34 times more jobs than just building another pipeline. The problem, of course, is that while companies like Enbridge are putting dollars on the table to build pipelines, governments are unwilling to make comparable sums available for these alternatives. And yet in Canada, a minimum national carbon tax of $10 a ton would raise $5 billion a year. The sum in question, and unlike a one-off pipeline investment, it would do so year after year. If policy options like that were on the table, the job versus environment dichotomy would all but evaporate. Which is another reason why today's climate movement does not have the luxury of simply saying no without simultaneously fighting for a series of transformative yeses. The building blocks of our next economy that can provide good clean jobs as well as social safety net that cushions the hardships for those inevitably suffering losses. It's pretty simple. Use the money that you're going to spend building a pipeline that's ultimately going to result in more emissions going into the atmosphere which are harmful, instead of doing that, spend that money toward more energy efficient projects. The science is telling you, the research that's being done, ultimately says that that's gonna create even more economic gain. But our short sightedness blinds us only to the short term. It's a philosophy that we have to change. It must always be remembered that the greatest barrier to humanity rising to meet the climate crisis is not that it is too late or that we don't know what to do, there is just enough time and we are swamped with green tech and green plans. We are afraid with good reason that our political class is wholly incapable of seizing those tools and implementing those plans. Since doing so involves unlearning the core tenets of the stifling free market ideology that govern every state of their rise to power. And it's not just the people we vote into office and then complain about, it's us. For most of us, living in post-industrial societies when we see the crackling black and white footage of general strikes in the 1930s, victory gardens in the 1940s, and freedom rides in the 1960s, we simply cannot imagine being part of any mobilization of that depth and scale. That kind of thing was fine for them, but surely not us. With our eyes glued to smartphones, attention spans scattered by clickbait, Loyalties split by the burdens of debt and insecurities of contract work? Where would we organize? Who would we trust enough to lead us? Who moreover is we? In other words, we are products of our age and of a dominant ideological project. One that too often has taught us to see ourselves as little more than singular gratification seeking units, or to maximize our narrow advantage while simultaneously severing so many of us from the border communities whose pooled skills are capable of solving problems big and small. 
This project also has led our government to stand by helplessly for more than two decades as the climate crisis morphed from a grandchild problem to a banging down the door problem. All of this is why any attempt to rise climate challenge will be fruitless unless it is understood as part of a much broader battle of worldviews. A process of rebuilding and reinventing the very idea of collective, the communal, the commons, the civil, and the civic after so many decades of attack and neglect. Because what is overwhelming about the climate challenge is that it requires breaking so many rules at once. Rules written into national laws and trade agreements as well as powerful unwritten rules that tell us that no government can increase taxes and stay in power or say no to major investments no matter how damaging or plan to gradually contract those parts of our economies that endanger us all. So how do we change a worldview and unquestioned ideology? Part of it involves choosing the right early policy battles, game-changing ones that don't merely aim to change laws but change patterns of thought patterns of thought, philosophy. That means that a fight for a minimum carbon tax might do a lot less good than, for instance, forming a grand coalition to demand a guaranteed minimum income. That's not only because a minimum income as discussed makes it possible for workers to say no to dirty energy jobs, but also because the very process of arguing for a universal social safety net opens up a space for a full-throated debate about values about what we owe to one another based on our shared humanity and what it is that we collectively value more than economic growth and corporate profits. I read a lot of quotes, but a lot of very long quotes, because I think the book does a great job of speaking for itself. As a species, we're faced with an existential crisis. What society tells us the value is directly leading to our extinction. We need a paradigm shift, and we can do this. There needs to be a social movement. And I'm going to do my part by spreading the word about what I feel is one of the best books ever written about climate change. So check this book out. This changes everything. It'll start you on a path toward a much better social philosophy. Well, this is The Black Ponder. Thank you for watching. Tune in next time for more philosophical thoughts.